Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Radical Respect Podcast. I'm Kim Scott. And I'm Wesley Faulkner, her co-host, and we are super happy to be back. We have a special guest. Kim, tell us a little bit about her. All right, Melissa Doman, welcome. Uh, Before I ask you to talk, I'm going to tell everybody who you are. You're an organizational psychologist, a former clinical mental health therapist, and the author of Yes, You Can Talk About Mental Health at Work, and Here's Why and How to Do It Really Well. Melissa works with companies across industries around and around the globe, including clients like Google, Dow Jones, the Orlando City Soccer Club, Microsoft, Salesforce, Siemens, Estee Lauder, and Janssen. What a great roster. She's spoken at South by Southwest and has been featured as a subject matter expert in CNN, Vogue, NPR, the BBC, CNBC, Inc., and LinkedIn's 2022 Top 10 Voices on Mental Health. Welcome, Melissa. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to this since we met at South by Southwest. It's been a long time coming. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. So talk to us about your book. It is so important that we learn how to talk about mental health issues at work. So so what prompted you to write it? And what what are, what, what are some key things that you think people need to know? So what I found is that there was so much awareness building going on. There was loads of destigmatization going on. And everyone's saying, mental health matters. Mental health is important. We need to talk about this in the workplace. And I was like, no one's teaching anybody how. Yes. And so listen, I will admit, of course I was part of that movement. Of course I was. Because that is the prequel to teaching people how to do it, is you have to establish the psychological safety, the, you know, overt permission to do so. But then everyone, did you ever see uh, Talladega Nights with Will Ferrell when he's a race car driver? Wesley, have you seen it? it. So basically, uh, shake and bake. And so basically (laughs) once everybody's like, yeah, this is great. And everyone was like, I don't know where to put my hands. What do I do with my hands? What do I say on a huge scale? And so yeah. I really thought, okay, no one's written the playbook. I guess I need to. And so I had enough accumulated speaking time and working with different organizations. And I was living in London at the time with my husband. And mm-hmm. I pitched a publisher and said, here's my idea. I would love to write a playbook that anyone can pick up, regardless of tenure, role, industry, to basically teach them how to talk about mental health at work and not mess that up. And then screw me. They said, yes. And I was like, oh no, I need to write this. Now now. I gotta do it. Panic. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, I will tell you, you can be an expert on something and not know how to write a book about it. And my editors are the reason it turned into the concrete solution oriented uh, piece of work that it is. And uh, I'm told it has equipped people with the tools that I wanted them to have. So I'm, I'm deeply appreciative of that. That's amazing. I, 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 I think that I've heard the movement, especially coming out of the pandemic, how yeah. mental health and stigmatization around that. Um, as a person who has ADHD, uh, there, the, that's kind of in, in terms of coming out my own journey, talking about mental health as well as all the things that may not be visible to other people. Yeah. Uh, is, is extremely important. And I guess it's part of the movement also is like bringing your whole self to work. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things about talking about it, um, I was wondering if you could highlight just one little piece, how do you feel, um, or what is something that someone should keep in mind when they're trying to listen to someone talking about mental health? <gasps> oh, I love that question. I love that question. And when it comes to, you know, talking about mental health in the workplace, it's the, it's the whole spectrum, you know, and uh, if you think about, for example, the feeling wheel from Dr. Gloria Wilcox, I'm obsessed with that because when we're talking about mental health at work, it's not even just disclosing if you have a mental health condition or a learning disability. I'm also neurospicy, by the way. I have ADD, uh, shiny red ball squirrel type. So, uh, <laughs> What we're talking about is 
describing that whole spectrum. And yeah. that's inclusive of all of the non-clinical emotions, non-clinical conditions, because mental health is the good stuff, the bad stuff, the neutral stuff, and everything in between. So when yeah. we're listening to someone talking about mental health at work, one of the best things to do is not assume what it is they're going to share, not assume why they're struggling, and not assume what they need. Because a huge mistake that people often make is they equate good helping with giving advice. Yes. But good helping looks like not only active listening, but asking someone, what is the type of support you need? How can yes. I best help you? Because some people will go a literal lifetime with never being asked that question. And so I think that as a listener, that is one of the most powerful things you can do is not assume what you're about to hear, why it's occurring, and to ask the type of person, what type of conversation do you want this to be? Yeah, I think that's really, I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. And I think as a, so I was, this is the most Gen X thing in the world. I think I'm <laughs> I was born in 1967. I don't know what that makes me, uh, what generation, but but I was never diagnosed by a doctor, but I have been often diagnosed by my employees who are millennials. <laughs> as, <laughs> and they're probably right. I'm sure they're right. Um, uh, and and it, it, it has actually been very helpful for me to understand the impact that I'm having on others, you know, when I think I'm just trying to do what I need to do to get through the mm -hmm. day. And so yeah. the the increased comfort with younger employees that I've had, um, who, who are able to notice, you know, th mm. this this seems like this is happening. You know, I'm not. You know, uh, how do you feel about that? Is that the <laughs> should we I have mixed feelings? Okay, yeah, I have I figured, mixed feelings. I figured, uh, both of you are looking like I'm not so sure, Kim. That's a good. <laughs> so so okay, I like that you use the word noticing. Because mm -hmm. the noticing technique is something that I really love because you know how much people love to be told how they think, how they feel, yeah. what diagnoses yeah. they have. And so saying I've noticed or it seems mm -hmm. is one of the most powerful sets of phrases in, in the workplace. And if we're going into like legal compliance land... Mm -hmm. No one should be saying to each other any yes. form of clinical anything. Yeah, we shouldn't be no diagnosing way. one another. Oh, no, no, no. Especially as a leader to a team member. Yes. No, these oh, were team the members. Lawsuit. <laughs> yes. These were these were team members to be their boss. So what I would say to that is, you know, younger generations have so much more access and comfort to clinical yeah. nomenclature than their elders. Mm -hmm. And I think that how they use that, mm -hmm. especially in the workplace, is far more liberal. Mm -hmm. It's far more, they're far more willing to do that without thinking of the reasonable boundaries yeah. around saying such things. Because you can tell someone, I notice that it seems like you're having trouble paying attention to me. Yeah. Or I notice that you seem disorganized. Or yeah. I notice that you launch into worry before I explain what's going on, which is not the same as, have you ever been assessed for ADHD? <laughs> Do you have generalized yeah. anxiety disorder? Oh, you are definitely autistic. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, but people do those things. And I'm people like, people do that. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it's, it's all in how you say it and it's all in how you use the noticing technique to, to yeah. start the conversation and see if someone even wants to have it and why yeah. they're saying it because why they're telling you also matters. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I was you, yeah, yeah. The, 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 it sounds like I, I've studied nonviolent communication and one of the tenets is about like not putting emotions or not saying someone else's emotions, but using yeah. more observations to describe what you're seeing because mm -hmm. those are objective instead of saying, you look or you are angry. Why are you angry at me? Mm -hmm. Just saying yeah. like you have this real ruffled expression, you know, more descriptive in terms of things that are objective sure. instead of things that are very subjective. 
Um, but it's, I think it, like it is a double-sided coin because, coin because people um, have released some of the stigma around it mm, uh, mm-hmm. even, and so they can freely say it, but someone who's from an older generation, um, they might still have the stigma and yeah, yeah. hearing someone call you that, uh, so using it yeah. so freely um, it m- may cause harm to that person, especially if it's totally inaccurate and defensive or even if yeah. it's if someone's not really to go there themselves, putting that label on them feels stigmatizing. Yeah. And also it's, uh, I wrote about this in the book where when we think about mental health language in general and language around mental illness or being neurodivergent, there are a lot of people who will inappropriately and or unintentionally co-opt that language and use it in workplace conversations where it has no business being. For example, I was in line uh, shipping something at UPS and there was this woman in front of me and I quote saying, oh, I have PTSD from that meeting. And I was like, the F you do. And I, I, I just heard her speaking about it and I was like, don't make a scene. Don't make a scene. This is not the place. This is not the She's trivializing PTSD. I mean, unless the bomb went off in the meeting, which I guess could have happened. I severely doubt that. Yeah. <laughs> and and just, I just, and, and, it happens all the time. Yeah. yeah. And mental illness in general, especially like when there's these mass shootings um, and how it's thrown around as in mm-hmm. those are kind of, um, I, I know we shouldn't talk politics. Um, but Come there, at me. I'm all about politics. difficult conversations. Yes. Oh, okay. I'm all about yes. difficult conversations. There, there was a uh, some sort of scuff up at the uh, Arlington National Cemetery. Yeah, yes, um, I heard all and, about it. And then Trump described the worker that was trying to enforce the rules as having a mental episode. Oh. Um, and, and it's one of those things where it's it is in in that case it was meant as an insult. Yeah, it wasn't mm-hmm. said it was. in a. It wasn't meant as a, a compassionate plea saying, oh, no. they're having a mental yeah. episode. And so we, sorry, we try Trump's to get them help. I'm sorry, Trump's not compassionate or... since when? <laughs> since when? Well, I'm just saying that when the term is used. Very low on the personally dimension. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's, and so I, yeah. I wish it was more, I wish it was used more often in yeah. the concern care, um, uh, like yeah. compassion instead mm-hmm. of the. Uh, mm-hmm. insulting and yeah. degrading mean and but that is also the stigma around this word how yeah how, in, in your book how do you tackle that stigma about being able to even speak it let alone describe yourself and anything that might be associated with it so this is what prompted me to include this piece in the book is when we were living in london and i was giving a keynote like right before the pandemic hit because I started subspecializing in mental health at work in 2018 before it was cool. And uh, this guy came up to me, middle-aged Caucasian British guy came up to me. We we're talking about what I was including in the keynote. And he leaned over and whispered and said, and I said, we all do. Are you trying to say you have a mental illness? And he said, yes. And I said, you don't need to whisper about either. Yeah. So these terms, mental health is still a dirty word. And it's, it's, I'm not going to say it's silly because there's so many systemic influences that make people arrive at that belief. And so I'm very medical about it. I, I don't go the bleeding heart route. I don't go the like, you know, advocate route. I go, Mental health is your baseline social, emotional, and cognitive functioning. It's the health state of an organ like any other organ. Prove me wrong. And everyone's like, well, when you put it like that. And I'm like, it, 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 you know, does, don't make it weird. It's the health state yeah. of an organ. Yes, it's the organ that governs your personality, your functioning, all these important things. But it's literally, it, it's a medical thing that we all share. Animals have mental health, for God's sakes. And when it comes to mental illness, there are lots of different ways to appropriately refer to that mental illness, uh, mental health condition in the UK, mental ill health. There are lots of ways to refer to it. It's also a medical thing. It is different forms of a, of a diseased illness state 
of an organ, like any other organ in the body. And so I'm very concrete about the whole thing. And I have yet someone, I have yet to have someone argue that because you can't argue it. And so then it becomes separating the actual definitions from the historical social conditioning that surround them. I think that is so helpful and so important. And I think, you know, to our previous conversation, for the same reason you wouldn't diagnose someone on your team with a physical illness. One, mm-hmm. it's it's not a good idea to try to diagnose someone uh, no. else. I mean, we can we can share our own diagnoses, but we cannot diagnose others, uh, you know, unless you're a doctor who's <laughs> equipped to do that. Yeah. And that's why I go out of my way to say to people, we're just teaching you communication skills about how to have this conversation appropriately within the context of work, not as Mm -hmm. a psychiatrist, not as a therapist, not as a doctor, nothing. It's we're teaching you the language, the nomenclature, and the right education to talk about something with the people you spend the most time with each week. It's people you work with. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's By any chance, uh, as a woman, I know we're we're we talked about curse words before. How, how do you <laughs> feel, or do you tackle the c word in the book, which is crazy? Um, how do you? Oh ta- my god! I was like, is he going to say it? Is he going to say it? <laughs> <laughs> how do you tackle the the association of the word crazy with uh, mental health? Um, yeah, I did that set up on purpose. I was, was. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Just what a tease. <laughs> I only say that I only say that because we lived in the UK for three years. That term is literally a term of affection. Yes, in really? I watched the, and then we, I, I've I watched the boys. <laughs> uh, that show. Yeah. And when we returned to the US, I was like, I was like, watch don't yourself. Don't say that. Yeah. Yes. It's just not the same. Don't slip. <laughs> um so I I'm fairly certain I did because it is so automatic to say you're being crazy and it, the thing is you need to be able to say the term if it's like a crazy situation there has to be some sort of not censored way to say crazy however when you attach it to emotional expressions at work based on gender which happens all the time and when someone is having a completely reasonable response to an upsetting situation, but because someone doesn't know how to handle it, they don't know why it's happening. They'll, they'll be very quick to label it as crazy, ridiculous, etc. I have this whole section where I went on a little bit of a, uh, we'll call it a harangue about gender based emotion shaming at work. And I was basically like, I was like, listen, regardless of the gender you identify as, even if you're non-binary and the the gender identity evolution has just been incredible, you know, even just throughout my career, because I'm an elder millennial, or as we call zillennial, it doesn't matter the gender you identify as, everyone's screwed because there are these ridiculous emotional rules, historical rules attached to how you display emotion in general and at work. And what you are or or not supposed to do, to which I say that is the dumbest shit I've ever heard. Yeah. 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 I think that's I think that's so important. Um so what do you say in in the book? Like, do you address that particular word or do you more broadly like I think that I have addressed it as the word crazy and how it is not appropriate to use in response to those situations. Yeah. And sloppy, depending on it's, it's sloppy. It's sloppy. I mean, usually yeah. we mean, what, what do we mean? We mean, you know, uh, you know, I don't think your reaction was rational. You think, mm-hmm. I, you know, I think you're taking too big a risk. Like what, you know, I, and I think being precise about what you mean always helps one communicate better intentionality of language is another big section in the book because when you get sloppy and talking about mental health and mental illness and behavior and emotions at work, that is a great way to make things go off the rails. Mm -hmm. And I did this whole section on, if you're going to talk about something that is so deeply personal and riddled 
with a variety of influences and rules, you owe the respect to that conversation to be specific about what you're saying and not to resort in name calling and labeling. So even, and again, another example, not as crazy, but you're being so OCD. Yeah. Things like that. There are people who have debilitating, debilitating OCD and how, I mean, it's just so um, careless and yeah. very sloppy. Yeah, it's it's a form so, of violent language, you know. Like really to say is. to say, you know, I have PTSD from that meeting is mm-hmm. ridiculous. That's that's not ridiculous. you know you don't. It's it's it is demeaning to something that's very real and very important to take seriously. Yeah, it really is, and it's one thing if you own pieces of information about yourself. So, for example. For my team, because I, I have a team now and I'm, I'm a leader now, so talk about a steep learning curve for myself. Uh, I always tell them my love language is anxiety. And that is why I bought this anxiety <laughs> plushie at almost 40, uh, because I, I own that that is part of how I am wired. Yeah. And but if any of them and they never in a million years would were to weaponize that against me can't go back can't go back yeah uh, yeah and it's it's something to be treated with uh care and consideration yeah so what do you recommend if you are going to talk about your own mental health at work mm-hmm. and let's say maybe you're working at a big company not with like a small team which small team can make it you know, if the small team is good, it's really much easier. And if the small team is bad, it's really much worse. But let's imagine you're at a, a bigger company. What are some of the things you can do to to make sure you don't get punished for talking about your mental health at work? That is a very good question. Now, there are, let's start with the foundation stuff. So obviously, I am not an attorney. Uh, but that's why I partnered with an employment attorney for a couple of the deliverables in my business. Because I don't love when people talk about things they're not qualified to talk about. Yes. So she's fantastic. I found the one hysterical, easy to understand attorney in the United States. Hysterical meaning funny. Funny. (laughs) Hysterical meaning funny. I've seen her present and I was was cackling like a witch. She's just so funny. Yes. Um, So when it comes to talking about mental health at work, it is one thing if you're talking about general mental health. It mm-hmm. is another thing if you disclose a mental illness, which is a protected characteristic under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Mm-hmm. So let's say that you are wanting to disclose about a mental illness in the workplace. Mm-hmm. I think that sharing with intention is very important because oftentimes most of the onus, if not all, is put on the listener and none on the sharer. And I think that's not sustainable. I think it's a two way street. So if you're going to disclose about your mental illness at work, I would think about why. Why are you sharing mm-hmm. that information? What mm-hmm. do you want people to do with that information? What do you need from them? What is the highlight that you're going to share because they don't need your entire 40-year mental health history? And who are you going to speak to that you can actually trust to take this information the right way instead of turning you into the office T? I think that's what the kids say. The tea, What's, right? What is that, is that what they say? Spilling the tea, like oh, spilling yeah, yeah, the yeah, gossip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Spilling yeah. The tea. yeah. yeah. See, yeah. I'm not cool. <laughs> uh, so I, I would do that. And also when it comes to general mental health disclosures that are, are not clinical in nature, it's really that same set of questions, but also being aware that if someone, there's a huge difference between someone kind of like fudging the process and seeming like they mean well when they're listening to you, but they say the wrong thing and make you feel uncomfortable versus someone completely betraying your confidence and turning it into a hostile work environment, which is very, very suable. Yes. So I'm not a litigious person, but when that stuff happens, I'm like, go to war. And so I think, I think it it happens all the time. I talk about it in the book. I talk about it in my work where I say, listen, these conversations are not always going to go well. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it will get messed up, but don't lose hope because it depends on what type of messed up it becomes. Is it a misunderstanding? 
Thank you. I appreciate that. Is it is it just a misunderstanding? Is someone being what is the term I want to say? Um, someone maybe crazy? Just doesn't un- <laughs> no. <laughs> malevolent. Is, malevolent Mal- versus malevolent versus just uh, ignorant. There's a big yes. difference. Ignorance. Yeah, I can forgive. Difference. Malevolence is. A I can't thing. forgive. Yeah. May I tell you a very brief tale yes, of please. malevolence? Please. This poor. I love that movie. Oh wait, no. <laughs> Is what was her name? Malevol- Maleficent? Maleficent? Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. It's like Angelina Jolie. I digress. Yeah. Uh, see, um, <laughs> shiny red ball ADD is yeah. the, one, the one that I have. Um, my husband finds it deeply entertaining, as does my dog. So, <laughs> so I was interviewing someone for the book. Such mm-hmm. a kind, kind, wonderful person. Uh, this person, so I purposely gave identifiers uh to show that mental health issues mental illness span gender location culture etc because it can impact anybody so this was someone who identified as male who uh was middle-aged of um indian descent and worked in the technology industry and this person had the courage and this was in the UK, by the way, which, you know, there are lots of different influences yes. around having these conversations, depending on where you are. This person had the courage to tell their boss that they have generalized anxiety disorder. Lots of people have that. Mm-hmm. And basically said, hey, you know, I'm telling you this because I know I come off certain ways. I don't want you to fill in the reasons. So I'm, I'm letting you know why to improve our working relationship. And the conversation went fine. But then the manager gossiped about what he said to the rest of the team. Oh, no. And when this person confronted the manager and was like, I trusted you. Why did you do that? The manager said, oh, stop it. You're being anxious. Oh, God. Uh Uh-huh. Wow. Yes. And these things happen all the time. So I think it's about understanding what is the source of things going wrong. What are the options available to you to handle it on your own if you need to speak with HR, if you need to speak with an attorney, and not immediately think the sky is falling if it goes wrong because why it's going wrong matters and how you can handle it will vary. Yeah. And so I I don't get it twisted with people because I think if you put this toxic positivity lens on these conversations, you set people up with the wrong expectations of how to handle reality when yeah. it occurs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know we talked about the destigmatize for younger generations of the words and terms. Uh, older generations might still have that stigma. Mm-hmm. There's um, in the neurodivergent space, there's always this, this, this debate whether you should disclose or not disclose. Mm-hmm. And also who do you disclose to? Do you go to HR first? Or do you go to your manager first? And all mm-hmm. this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, there, I'm seeing, does this translate also to mental illness with an advice that I give to some people who ask me uh, mm-hmm. on the neurodivergence side, sometimes mm-hmm. you can disclose without naming and labeling saying mm-hmm. like, these are where I have some um, troubles. Here's oh, yeah. how I am having issues without actually oh, yeah. putting a name or a label on it. Mm-hmm. Um, have, do you give the same type of advice for people who have like a, a, a diagnosis, but you don't disclose the diagnosis, but you give a description of it so that they don't necessarily put that label on you of what they think that is. So here's what I typically do. And I realize that I, I'm being a little silly right now, but I never call it advice. I call it guidance. Very I, wise. I love that word. I... I am such a stickler for words uh, and I'm sure it annoys the daylights out of my husband and the people close to me. And I'm like, I love you. But I, the guidance I tend to give is I think the end result is what matters most. So let's say for example, that someone has a diagnosed mental illness or diagnosed, you know, learning disability or something cognitive. If they need accommodations, in the workplace. 
there will be the necessity of having medical documentation to go along with that accommodation request, which would also require a diagnosis. But that's something that you handle with human resources. That is not something that you handle with your boss directly because your HR representative, because they are trained on state law, federal law, et cetera, will advise you on what you would be useful to disclose to a manager, what you don't have to disclose to a manager, even if you have accommodation and so on and so forth. But if you really just don't, you're not going the accommodation route, you don't want people to know what the diagnosis is, then what I usually say as guidance is if you're experiencing a problem that is impacting your work, which is impacting how you interact with other people, it's impacting how you do your projects, et cetera, et cetera. The diagnosis doesn't really matter. It's about the behaviors that you have and the struggles that you have that are tripping you up at work. So I say, if you're having trouble with prioritization, or you're having trouble with communicating when you run into a roadblock, you have trouble articulating yourself. If it's you get easily overwhelmed, if someone treats something like a five alarm fire every single time, instead of seeing things in a gradient, I would focus on that and say to them, I struggle with X behavior. I'm, I'm not sure whether or not you notice, but the reason I'm telling you is because I want us to work together and get the best out of each other. So what would really be helpful for me is if you do X, Y, Z, does that feel like something we can do, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I think it's individually dependent. Yeah. I think that's really, I think that's really helpful uh, guidance. <laughs> can, I, can, I ask, can I ask for some clarification though? Like, if I if I have a mental uh, uh, if I have a diagnosis, mm -hmm. and it would be much easier for me if you worked differently. <laughs> to what extent do I have a right to ask you to work differently because of my diagnosis? You know, I I don't think that it's. I think it's about finding ways to work together that meet in the middle. That's yeah. what I think. Yeah. I don't think that. I'm going to say something very unpopular, and okay. I hope that's okay. Of course. Taylor, Taylor Swift sucks. Dude. No, I mean, that would be an unpopular one. You don't. To Dude. clarify, Wesley does not think that. <laughs> no, to, but it's just something unpopular to say. <laughs> two workshop participants at a conference that I was speaking at got into a 12-minute fight about Taylor Swift. And I am not a shrinking violet, and I could not get them to stop. <laughs> so, yes, be careful. Okay, you can say something unpopular, but don't say anything that unpopular. No, okay, was, all right. yes. no, her music is fine. I'm, yeah. I'm not a Swifty. Her music is fine. So, um, although she did get three hundred thousand people to register to vote. A few days ago, so okay, yeah. I'm a fan. I'm, a, I'm Taylor. A Taylor fan. moves socioeconomic yeah. mountains. <laughs> yes, yes. So the the the, world... the the least unpopular thing besides no, no, no. that. Say the most unpopular yeah. thing. We're <laughs> this is this is you know I'm all about <laughs> radical candor. Be radical and be. I candid. know. I be care candid. enough about you to give you this difficult feedback. <laughs> so the world doesn't care about people's individual struggles. Really doesn't. It really doesn't. You have care about your individual struggles and make sure hopefully the people around you have some consideration for that too. And that yeah. sounds deeply dispassionate, but it's the truth. And so there are two parts of accountability. You have the people in your team and your leader who have some level of responsibility to speak to you in a way that you would like to be spoken to. You also have a responsibility to figure out you, those aspects of emotional intelligence to be self-aware enough to self-manage, to deal with the adversity that having a mental health condition or a disability will create. You can't get the world to always bend to your needs. You can ask the world to consider it, 
but you also have to make that effort. And people don't like hearing that, but it is the truth. And so I think that there's enough of a valid reason to inform people about, hey, I struggle with this. Would you mind doing this to get the best out of me and get the best out of each other? Here's what I'm also going to commit to because it is my responsibility to manage my mental health and how that shows up at work and my asking for what I need to be successful. It comes from both ends. That I think is such brilliant guidance for us to end on because that feels really, (laughs) that feels really true to me. That feels very realistic and it shouldn't be unpopular uh, because, you know, sometimes I've had people on my teams and one person has, has said, I have this issue and I need you to behave this way. And this person is like, I have this issue. And and, and, and like, no, uh, it's, we've, we've got to figure out how to work well together, but we also, we all have, we all have, as you say, everybody has mental health of some sort or another, and we all have to, um, we all have to own it and, and, and to be, make reasonable accommodations for the other person, but you can't turn the whole organization upside down. No. And I think that one of the ways that, uh, this movement kind of goes off the rails sometimes is there is such a a huge swing to make sure that every person's comfortable, everybody gets what they need. And I go, what planet are you living on? Yeah. (laughs) Yes. Yes. I I mean, consideration definitely, but you can't be everything to everybody and everybody can't get a hundred percent of their needs met at the same time. It's impossible. Yes. So why can't we just aim at realistic and apologizing when we fuck it up. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Even better mic drop. Melissa Doman, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I love this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everybody. And get a copy, if you haven't already, of Yes, You Can Talk About Mental Health at Work. Take care, everybody. Bye.